Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for your description. I mean, you pretty much uh, said almost everything. Uh, I, we really want to thank the Architectural League uh, for the invitation and to have the opportunity to show and share uh, our, work our work with you. And what the project we are going to see today, tonight, uh, they are very representative about uh, our whole engagement with, uh, with, with architecture, that they go through very, very small projects uh, to very big uh, urban projects. And uh, also what I want to say is that why Architecture 911? And everyone thinks that, uh, that it's because of emergency. It has to do with emergency, but it has to do at the beginning because it was the number of the building we used to work in for almost nine years. Now we moved and the number is different. So everyone is asking us, are you going to change the name of the, of the frame? Say, well, we are staying with the 911 because it also has to do with whatever Dan described that about the uh, emergency, about the social, about the political, and uh, that we, re we, re we really need to, to do things, uh, act fast, think fast, and deal with all the uh, Mexico problematic. So I will let Jose run you through the whole project. Thank you. In a way, I have this theory that the only way that we got this recognition had to do with the emergency and emerging voices. Uh, and, and as Heidi has said, uh, we're, we're both, uh, the name is tongue in cheek, but also about the way we approach the work and the way we approach the city. Basically, we're, uh, we live and work in Mexico City. Uh, different from other uh, emerging voices practicing in Mexico, all of our work is in Mexico. And, and I do think this makes a difference because in the way we've approached the architecture, we, are, we like to think we are informed by the city and, and we're interested in seeing how architecture can transform the city. In a way, it's very urbanistically driven. And this concern, what we talk about when we talk about Mexico City, this is a, uh, the New River uh, Plan or Cortez Plans 1524. And for us, the interest is how you get from here in the 16th century to this in the beginning of the 20th century to a city that has grown from 325,000 people in 1900 to 20.1 million people today in less than 100 years. So, the, so Mexico City is, in a way, the city of a, of a 20th century. It's a 20th century production, but it, within this production, we have to understand how architecture has related to, to what has happened in the city. And the history of the city is a city of uh, boom and bust cycles. Every six years, for almost 60 years, there was a crisis after the presidential, presidential election. And this graphic, which is a project we did for the um, curatorial uh, show at the Center for Architecture, it was an exhibition called Mexico City Dialogues, in a way explains this this relationship between architecture and architectural production, both with the demographic and the, uh, and the urbanistic changes. Uh, and, and Mexico City, in a way, uh, one tends to assume certain, certain things about the, the city. Uh, we tend to think it's the largest city in the world, which it isn't. We tend to think it's the most polluted city in the world, which it isn't either. But nevertheless, as uh, Carlos Monsivay says, we Mexico, Mexico City citizens, we like to, to uh, brag on the, a kind of chauvinism of the catastrophe. Uh, and this chauvinism of the catastrophe can be explained as it, re as it relates to infrastructure. This is a photograph by Hector Garcia showing one of the uh, recurrent floods in the, in the city in the 1950s but also very much connected to uh, the, almost the geologics of the city. Uh, this is the 1985 earthquake, toppling one of the most important, uh, uh, one of a very important building and a very important complex in Tlatelolco. But the same goes ab about uh, pollution. And uh, in spite of the fact that pollution has receded in the last 20 years, this, this imaginary still very much construct the way we approach the city and hence the idea of emergency. And hence the idea that, that we understand architecture that operates somewhere in between protest as a way to challenge status quo. This is a four million people march uh, seven years ago to protest violence and insecurity in the city, but also other ways of protesting. This is, a, this is one of the most uh, dramatic cases of exclusion 
in, uh, in Mexico City, which is a gated community where actually gate, uh, the notion of gatedness becomes a territorial action. To, to separate um, a segment of society uh, through, a, uh, through a, a tunnel going into a completely different ravine. So with these conditions, how does architecture engage or how does architecture resist the city? Or how does architecture relate to this uh, very difficult uh, territory to map, to plan, to imagine, to construct? And this is in a way uh, some of the tasks that we have approached from our office. Well, this is a new building we moved in and we chose, uh, we chose this building because it has, it's a very important building, very modern uh, iconographic uh, building. So uh, also it's really close to where we live. So uh, be, to get, be close in a city like Mexico City, really, it really makes a big difference. So this is a place we are working now. We are around a group of 16 people uh, growing sometimes, uh, I would say the most to 24 people and uh, the uh, smallest to 10 people. So that's uh, the physical uh, space where we uh, work now. And, and as Sadie was saying earlier, uh, if we had to describe the focus of our work, it's really the lack of focus. In, uh, and I say it, it's, uh, we've done things from uh, 40 square meters to a master plan of 600 hectares. Uh, we're doing institutional, we're doing exhibitions, curatorial work. But this, in a sense, this lack of focus has become a strength for us because it allows us to move freely within many spectrums, not only is of scale, but uh, thematically and in terms of the issues we, we, uh, we approach. And it has become also a way to be, to, to be resilient in, the, in, in regards to changes and economic, political, uh, but even client uh, uh, demands. So within the last four years where the world economy has taken a, a where we've been able to sustain these 16 people that Saidi was talking about. If there's one thing that defines our, our approach to architecture is that we're interested in connecting the physical with the social. This is a photograph of Tlatelolco, the most important project by Mario Pani, 13,000 units of housing done in 1963. And this is, and the the side on the the photo on the right is the the it's a few minutes before the massacre in Tlatelolco, um, um, just five years after it opened. So, in, in a sense, if if Corb was asking in the in the twenties whether it was architecture or revolution, we we subscribe to that tradition that architecture can make a difference in connecting the physical and the social. And we have to see where. Where, is the, the, where can autonomy be relevant and where can engagement and resistance be relevant? We're gonna show a number of projects uh, which deal with these issues and we'll, every time we show a project or a constellation of projects, we'll talk about uh, some of the issues and the context in which it was uh, created. This was a competition we were invited by Fernanda Canales as well, so we make a team with her. And this is a school design in Monterrey and what it was very, very, very pretty much interesting of this site was the whole landscape. We had, we, at some point, we have the, the mountains at the back, but we also have a river in front. So how we deal with these natural conditions? The, the, it's interesting, I, I was telling Anne earlier, that is, in this competition, it was a restricted competition, uh, the four other teams were previews, uh, emerging voices, uh, which we, we, we're glad that we beat them. <laughs> but it, to, to, see, to try to imagine why this uh, is relevant in, for us, it's, it's a competition uh, among very dear colleagues, but it, it has to do with a, almost a, strat a strategic approach to the competition itself and then uh, further on with the building. It's a building that got, uh, got built under 4,500 pesos per square meters, which to put things in perspective is like $30 a square feet of construction. Uh, so it's, it's basically a decorated shed, if you can call it like that. And, and within this, this notion of a very tight budget and a very tight uh, uh, schedule to develop it, because it, this is a, uh, it has to be designed and built within a one-year frame. You finish school, uh, uh, we start designing in August, and by August of the next year, before the new school year arrives, you have to finish the project. 
So uh, the project and the construction. So it has to do, it's a project that has to do with uh, uh, achieving critical mass. It's a 5,000 square meter uh, building. It's an, let's call it, a, it's a private school somewhere in between a university and an extended um, uh, art school. And, uh, but it has to do with, co com uh, on the one hand, uh, congestion, but also fragmentation. How can we construct and put together the 5,000 square meters and achieve critical mass? But on the other, how can we begin to have these small differentiations that relate the profile of the building to the campus, to the program in which these openings begin to relate to the uh, either the cafeteria, the library, or other or the uh, or the um, other spaces of the school. So the, uh, also, it, it it was very important about the whole program how the people and use this space. That was a very important issue. Uh, try to create like a community uh, where the classrooms are facing the, uh, the exterior but all the, all the uh, social programs are like in the heart of the, of the building. And that's why this fragmentation of the, of the openings related, you, you, you have like both a relation, the interior relation, also the exterior relation to the landscape. And to open this, uh, these windows were like a, a very important uh, issue in, in a place like this. It, this is a cafeteria, one of these uh, arms extending out of the, of the box, and then there's this, this central space uh, again. It's a, in spite of not being the first competition we, we won, it's, a, it's really the first uh, big commission in which we made a jump from sort of uh, uh, having ideas about how to deal with the client, how to communicate uh, uh, certain thoughts about architecture, budget, uh, client relationships in a very specific site such as, as it is Monterey. And um, here's another uh, picture at night. And the, uh, the next break we're going to talk about is the expansion of the Spanish Cultural Center. It's re really the oldest project we've, uh, we're presenting today, but one which is, again, relevant for us. This, uh, we were invited by Javier Sanchez, uh, one of the most talented and uh, prolific Mexican architects and a very dear friend of us to develop uh, this competition. In a, in a specific part of the city. This, this uh, project, in a way, addresses many of the issues, the problematics, the limits of, uh, of the work we do. But uh, in a way, it's a, we can do a forensic uh, uh, exam of the building and see where, where it goes right, where it goes wrong, and how, uh, how it relates to other work that we have done in these past 10 years. First of all, it's on the historic center, a place which, up until a few years ago, was uh, uh, almost all abandoned. Uh, this is an image of uh, how street vendors had taken over the, most of the streets of the historic center. Uh, so it's, it's a building which all the streets are bustling, but then all the buildings are empty. So it's like an inversion of the traditional uh, infrastructure versus building. And it's a, in a fantastic site just behind the cathedral. Uh, so in a, in a tiny street connecting to uh, to, to streets, the streets of Guatemala and Donceles, this building begins to be understood as a passage. How can architecture perform urbanistically? How can architecture, how a transformation of type, which is uh, the type of the, of the Galeria, how can we begin to, uh, uh, to embed it with other qualities of uh, contemporary architecture, so, such as density, such as the overlap of, uh, of a sectional, uh, sectional programs, and related to the needs of a contemporary cultural arts, arts center, such as it is with the, with the Spanish Cultural Center. Another thing which is relevant, it is a, it is a building for a uh, foreign country. So the client is not Mexican, the parameters of working, communicating, dealing with, uh, with the production of this building, uh, in a way explain why it has taken almost uh, eight years to, to develop it, but also, um, if not explain, at least open up, the, again, the limits uh, of the building. It should be said that it is the first building out of scratch that has been done in the historic center in over 30 years. So uh, one of the reasons has to do historical preservation. Uh, the, the thing about the historic center is relevant because it's a place that, regardless of the fact that over 50% of the buildings have been produced in the 20th century, there's not a single building of the 20th century which is uh, considered of historical worth. So there's a, a kind of a, a schizophrenia between what you think is relevant to an environment 
and how you approach the preservation uh, laws to protect it. So it was a project that took many, many years just to jumpstart from the ground, very complex negotiations, and negotiations that some uh, in, in a way have to do with traditional understanding of, of uh, adaptation uh, to the 18th century building, to the, uh, to the 20th century building, but also to the program, and, 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 and very much to the cathedral, which is our immediate neighbor to the south. But then at the same time, one has to resolve the, the problems of a cultural center program. So this stacking up of programs, this, uh, this resection in which we have uh, a number of things appearing from service, uh, from service to a site museum, obviously any place you dig in the historic center, there will be an archaeological site to be found. The interesting thing is that in the process of building this uh, almost 30 feet uh, deep well, there was a platform, a, a pre-Hispanic platform, which had to be supported from underneath and then dug underneath to, to build services and then reinstate this as a site museum. On top of that, there is what they call the SpaceX, which is an auditorium or multi-purpose space. There's gallery, there's classrooms, and there's a projection room. So to negotiate with very, uh, under a very tight uh, straight jacket, uh, became the driving uh, force for this project. And of, and of course, uh, the idea that you could circulate from one street through the building and exit uh, on the other side of the street became also um, a driving force. And, and, the, uh, and the plans in a way explain these complexities, both structurally, because we had to have uh, almost 60 feet wide uh, spaces without columns for the auditorium, uh, but at the same time done on, uh, under very, uh, uh, very bad terrain because of both uh, um, water and uh, subsidence. So, so the, building, th the building tries to negotiate this and organize this uh, as a section. And just on top of the service, uh, of, uh, on the service, under, um, uh, service spaces at uh, minus 10 meters, we have this archaeological museum which on top of that, it has uh, uh, the entrance and gallery space, uh, 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 an auditorium which can be used as a multi-purpose space. On top of that, uh, a gallery space for exhibitions, which uh, can, uh, faces the cathedral uh, to the north and extends into a terrace. And on top of that, a space which is used for seminars. And on top of that, a terrace. So, to, to understand, again, the, the limited successes of this project or the, the successes of this project has to do with, again, working under the, the tight constraints of political, historical preservation, and even economical maneuvers to get these things done. And in a sense, we're happy with the way, uh, with the, way the, the, the building came, came out. Two projects which are on, uh, related to this action and in, in a way uh, started a little bit later but were finished much earlier are the offices for this guy. This is a project we did with Anton Garcia Abril of Ensemble in which uh, the offices for this guy uh, were taking on what used to be one of uh, Hernán Cortés houses, a uh, uh, 16th century home uh, property which got extended in the 18th century and we had to intervene to turn into an office and again a cultural space. Uh, under, the, under the magnifying glass of uh, people from preservation committees, from multiple levels of uh, government, which were uh, making sure we didn't do anything to endanger what's considered historical uh, uh, heritage. If we, if we go back then, you, you can see that we were not able to build all, all the way into the front of the building. We have to retract back so that they say we, we are not uh, dealing with, uh, with, the, with the context. So those are the things that happen in downtown Mexico City. And it's interesting because we, we learned after working in this project, we learned to pick our fights. If the first project became quite aggressive in terms of, a, or ambitious in terms of how to operate in the historic center, and then it gets, if not trickled down, but then we get to negotiate reality. In this other project, we decided to focus on the inside, on a relationship between new elements and old elements. Be very careful about restoring the old elements, working with, uh, with the masonry workers, with the, the, the people that know exactly how to preserve uh, whether it's wood, uh, plaster, or, or, uh, or masonry, uh, 
Uh, but then uh, have a, um, an interesting dielectric relationship with the, with, the, with the glass, with the frosted glass, and with the new the salam wood. And it has to do with these uh, small, uh, small moments in which, for example, uh, uh, one, the entrance space gets all cladded in wood, or, or the auditorium becomes just an adaptation of an existing uh, open room facing the street, or uh, the extension of the stairs heads into, into a terrace, uh, in the, a roof terrace that opens up with these almost four meter high walls into uh, the existing city. And this, this is, a, again, a, uh, a problem of negotiation. It has, a, uh, has to do a problem, uh, a project with, uh, in which we, again, learn to pick our fights. Uh, a different project is a, is a project, again, started after the, the Spanish Cultural Center, but finished much earlier, in which is a, a client which, uh, seeing all the problems which is to build in the historic center, uh, he decides to build this uh, illegally, basically, uh, not ask for permits and not, uh, not tell everyone that you're actually doing a building behind the facade. And, and that's what um, for us is, is, is relevant. In some cases it's uh, embracing, in some cases it's resisting the processes of transformation. So in a, in a place uh, really uh, 100 meters away from the Spanish Cultural Center, we have this, uh, th this uh, sort of modern uh, glass and steel box uh, which fits into the, the facade of another building, and it's, very, it's adjacent to one of the most important museums, uh, which is San Ildefonso Museum, uh, literally just a few blocks from the, uh, just a block away from the Spanish Cultural Center. So it's not, all, it's not about the form, it's, it's actually about how the process uh, gets done in order to avoid having to ask for permits. I hope this is not uh, being recorded to Mexico, being podcast to Mexico this moment. But, uh, but uh, in a way, architecture is also politics. It's, it actually, architecture is very much about politics. And it, architecture is about uh, transforming processes fr and, uh, from outside, but also from, from the inside. And, and we've been uh, interested in seeing where, again, where do you resist and where do you engage? Uh, and this, this engagement becomes crucial in projects that deal with, with historical environments. We we're, we're, have been glad to be invited by the Ministry of Culture, um, uh, Consuelo Sizar, who's putting together one of the most ambitious cultural projects uh, uh, in the history of Mexico, which is to actually uh, gather all the main books, the, the main book collections for the, from the foremost Mexican intellectuals of the 20th century and organizing them in this 17th century building, which is La Ciudadela, which used to be the former uh, uh, Me National Mexican Library. So he's inviting uh, over 10 architects, each of them to design one of the collections. Uh, we always tease that this can become a freak show or it can become really uh, a very ambitious project. And uh, we got invited to do the, the collection of Jaime Garcia Terres. It's literally a 170 square meter um, uh, intervention, just in tiers. But one in which uh, the, the building next to, uh, the collection next to us uh, uh, was done by, is, is being done by Javier Sanchez. And the one on the other side uh, is being done by Bernardo Gomez Pimienta. And it, it's interesting to see how this, uh, at the same time, collabor collaborative processes, but, uh, uh, but simultaneously understanding of a, of a site and a context can take ma many different guises. This, uh, this is actually in the process of, big, uh, of getting finished. It's a project that deals with three actions, which is to build these three very heavy, very, uh, let's call them, um, yeah, very heavy boxes. Uh, one of each wall, which become bookcases, and a third one suspended from the roof, which becomes this light device. And, and uh, uh, they establish a relationship with the, uh, with the existing building uh, as a, and let me go back, as a, as a kind of a bento box in which you, you do like a tray, which is uh, independent of the existing building, and then you have, uh, you have these elements somewhere in between furniture and architecture and this will get opened in, uh, in the month or so. I think what was very interesting about this project that all of us were given, all the architects participating in this project were given the same space. So it's just very interesting to see how everyone decided to do 
their own project basically with the same size, same uh, square meters. So I think it's a, it's a good exercise. The, the next project which has to do also with intervention on existing, uh, on existing buildings has to do also with a, with a kind of political action. And it's a, the transformation or uh, transformation more than renovation of the Cicados Public Art Gallery. Cicados, as you may know, is uh, one of the most important Mexican muralists, one of the foremost 20th century Mexican artists. Uh, but but uh, similar to other muralists, uh, fellow very much engaged with politics. He spent some time in prison. And for us, the most interesting part of uh, Cicado's persona has to do with this rapport between public transformation uh, let's say, the physical transformation of public art vis-a-vis -vis the, the public transformation of society. In other words, for him, art had, uh, had a, a transformational agenda, which extended to the way he, uh, he inherited, after he died, his, uh, his collection. He opened a, a, a public gallery, which became the Sala de Arte Público, which used to be his, his house studio. Similar to many other home studios in Mexico, over the years, it, it got transformed, it got another level, uh, it, it, uh, it had a different uh, set of transformations at the facade, at the interior, and this was the environment that we were faced um, a couple of years ago. Uh, not only the way that uh, vegetation had taken over the, the building, uh, creating even problems in terms of uh, uh, insulation and humidity, but this was uh, through a series of interventions, it, the way that the entrance was configured and the way that the gallery space had, uh, had, been, uh, had been established. There was an interest to, to connect the Cicado's agenda, the idea of this canonic muralist, to the idea of contemporary art. And, and in the last 12 years, that agenda has been played out in many different guises. The new director, Diane Pimentel, invited us to think of how can this relationship be taken to a next level and how can we think incrementally in a number of transformations uh, that not, not only would, would change the space uh, as, a, as a one shot, but, but allow for further transformations to happen over time. And in a way we thought about uh, uh, an incremental master plan, a master plan of small actions uh, with budgets of less than $50,000 each time, and each of these transformations could add up every time you did something else. The first one had to do with a, a complete reassembly of the public space and entrance, and the second one had to do with the recovery of, of, the, of the courtyards. And in, and in doing such, we were, and, and this is a, if we, if we had to define very cynically what is that we did, we basically tore down two walls. But in that operation, what we were able to do is to regain that publicness of, uh, of Cicado's art. And we created an infrastructure for the facade to, to become an, a space for, uh, for, uh, for art projects. This is Post Miseria, project by Artemio. Uh, and, and in a way, by, by taking away these two walls, we brought down the murals back to the street, which is where, where Zicados always wanted them from, from the start. And uh, it's literally demolition and a paint job, and uh, a little bit more than that. But in the process, in the, in the months or year and a half since it has been opened, it has allowed for, an, for this uh, sort of growing um, and development processes in which uh, New artists, uh, this is Roman Signer, uh, uh, Swiss artists, ha have, have begun to occupy both the space, the facade, and the gallery in a different fashion. And for us, this is re the real power of architecture. Really, architecture for us starts the moment the architect leaves. Uh, it starts with the drawing, ends with the building, then starts again with the occupation. And that, for us, is, is quite interesting. How can one either hang a kayak place uh, overturned chairs or allow for the murals to extend outside into the street again. Uh, the second stage has been the demolition of this wall, which has liberated this fantastic uh, stair and ramp, uh, giving a new meaning to the, to the courtyard. So this is, again, super tiny intervention, but at the same time, uh, 
uh, capable of multiplying uh, tenfold the audience of, uh, of people and visitors to the, to the museum. And, and connecting, uh, for the first time in a long time, the agenda, the political agenda of Siqueiros and the social agenda of transformation of Siqueiros with the agenda of contemporary art. The, the next project we're going to show is the uh, Iztacalco Urban Housing Project. And it's, a, it's an important project for us. It's a, a, again, this is one of the projects which uh, are relevant for, uh, in terms of performative level. How, what it has done for housing and what it has done for certain developers rather than by its iconography. And to understand this, we have to, to understand the systems of production of housing in a place like Mexico. Uh, Mexico City has, uh, uh, has to get built over 50, well, over 50,000 units of housing get built every year in Mexico City. This is not Photoshop, this is actually happening in the peripheries of Mexico City. This is a traditional model of home building, which is a developer driven uh, thousands of units uh, simultaneously, cool de sacs, which later on get privatized, tiny uh, two square meter yards. But then this is the other half, which has to do with informality. Uh, my doctoral dissertation and our research, uh, early research had to do with this relationship between the spatial transformations of the periphery and the way they related to, the, uh, to informality. So this, this is the dilemma that we face in Mexico. Where do you operate? How do you transform the reality of the production of housing? You can either address the bottom part of the, of the photograph or you can either uh, address the, the upper part. For us, really, the most interesting part is really the threshold between these two. Why is this model, which has transformed the metropolitan area in many years, why it is getting transformed itself uh, uh, informally, so you 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 have these these homes, which over the first two years get transformed informally to many other uh, uses and um, and even uh, extensions. So to but but at the same time, the, the interesting thing about this is, is that you have maybe three or four major home builders, which are building tens of thousands of units uh, a year in the valley. So how do you convince the guys who are doing this? to do something else. And this is where actually we think about engagement. And this is where actually we move from resistance to move to use, if not only information as Dan was uh, acutely saying, but also our academic experiments to say that it is possible to have another option. And this option is not a, in itself political or social, but it comes from architecture, or from the autonomy of architecture, which is to think about morphology and to think about typology. And it's really to reinsert into the imaginary of these developers, which for over 40 years have uh, forgotten to build a block, to build dense urban housing, close to subways, clo close to bus corridors, close to, uh, to other uh, services and infrastructures. This uh, work was uh, commissioned by uh, one of the biggest developers in the whole country, not in just in Mexico City, but in the whole country. And I would, I would say that our task was to convince them not to occupy the whole uh, site. We, we told them that uh, they, that's why all these uh, exercises are uh, doing that, trying to explain them that probably we can get the same uh, number of uh, units by leaving more open space. And that was like the, the, like the big uh, exercise we were trying to, 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 to convince them because people need space and we are very used that uh, housing, uh, low income housing has to do with tons of uh, units all the same, all like next to each other with no open space. So we, we think that it's very, very important that uh, we create nice spaces for people living there. Uh, so we, we convince them with the, for the last uh, sketch that we should create uh, blocks, and these blocks create uh, some patios, big patios that are almost like uh, 30 meters by 16 meters, uh, 475, yeah, uh, families. So this is a complex of 750 units, so divided into six uh, patios that can create like this big unit, but small uh, units in itself. 
separated. So you, you don't really need to go and have all your neighbors ne next to you. So we divided this into six uh, blocks. So this is literally the guy who does this one day, uh, after one year of a, uh, sort of a washing his brain, we said, okay, let's do an experiment and let's think uh, about a different type of building housing. And uh, through these exercises that uh, Saidi explained, we have to take, and t take them to the same standards that these people operate in terms of return on, on investment, in terms of construction costs. So uh, really to, to, to get into that equation is, is the biggest task. And at some point they take a leap of faith but, uh, but at some point, they actually see that the formula makes sense. First of all, it's again, like I said, 400 meters away from a subway station, 200 meters away from a bus rapid transit corridor. This changes and, uh, completely the equation and becomes more appealing, which they can, this is by the way, a $60,000 housing, uh, 59 square meters, but, uh, but a housing that suddenly for the people buying the peripheries, rather than spend a quarter of their, of their income in transportation, to actually live in a house with a courtyard, it, it becomes a big difference. So it's a series of six blocks, almost 120 units uh, each of them. Uh, it's uh, five stories. With another big thing that we managed to convince them is that to invest a bit and to send the parking spaces underneath the street. If you have parking spaces at the surface level, you kill any kind of public and city life. The other, the other major accomplishment is to actually convince them that two on two on the blocks do mixed use on the ground floor, which adds a, co a completely uh, different uh, uh, quality of life. For you, I mean, for everyone here at the room, you must be wondering, well, this is all about common sense. Uh, as we say in Mexico, the common sense is the least common of them all. Uh, because somehow these guys who are building 10,000 units in the periphery somehow get uh, frustrated even at thinking at these things. So they make the leap of faith with us and to be fair, uh, they, uh, they considered us in uh, uh, even the <laughs> assuming certain risks that they were not willing to uh, consider into other circumstances to build this. Uh, they started with two blocks and now every single one of the apartments has been sold. Uh, this, uh, and to put things in perspective, with 50,000 units of housing being built in the city each day. This, last year, we, we received the National Housing Award for this project. It's a minor, a, a, in, in terms of architecture, it, uh, it changes a little bit. In terms of, uh, of the way that housing relates to the city, it changes a lot. Because after this project, the uh, CEO of the company told us, well, not only is it getting recognition, it's actually selling faster than the, and is being more profitable than the other model and the previous model of housing. In a way, it's a sustainability in an eggshell. And it has to do, again, with these uh, small, uh, small combinations of public and private, with these minor transformations that instead of having a car parking uh, at this level, you have the parking, the parking spaces down there. And it has to do with the way that these spaces can be inhabited in more than one, in, in more than one fashion. I mean, when we think these are just 50, 50 square meters, and when we think that these units are made not for one people, it's made out for probably five people. So how we get everything in there, very, very tiny, and how can we get some uh, light in the, to the whole unit? So these units have two side uh, views, and I think that's important. I mean, the public facing is, uh, one side, and the bedrooms uh, the other side. Having some middle spaces where we can accommodate an, a small room, a sm small studio. But uh, what is very funny is that the, that the norm itself in Mexico City does not allow you to put kitchens uh, without uh, ventilation, natural ventilation or illumination. So that that's makes it very, very difficult to solve in a very tiny space to solve that every single room has uh, nice views at least. So uh, we are like trying to to change little by little uh, these little things that really are very important because uh, you just get probably at most 10 meters uh, of facade. So how do you have to distribute the whole space in, in these 10 square meters long? Uh, it's not a simple uh, exercise, but 
it, it makes a lot of uh, difference. So how we were also very uh, impressed at how everyone appropriate of this space as different uh, ways. So someone will put the bedroom, whatever we, des we, we design a dining room. So how all these things move around, uh, we learn a lot of, uh, uh, from that. And uh, working on the same constraints again, uh, uh, has to be built at less than $33, $30 a square feet, and it has to have a return on investment of over 22%. And again, just th these are some images. I'll go very quickly because we have five minutes, but every single one of the apartments is facing these, uh, these interior courtyards, and each of them will be thematically designed for, uh, for different uses. And in the process, we, we think that there's new forms of community that can take place. So in a way, the, the, the small physical innovations can have uh, great social innovations. The next project uh, jumps into a, a more urban scale. And it started as research. It started as a, a project we did for the Rotterdam Biennale called Visionary Power, in which we were asked to deal with informality. We, we, we got commissioned to do a project uh, dealing with informality, but uh, we turned it into a project that also deals with mobility. How the informal project uh, prob problem is a problem of mobility. How do you get these people to the city? And how do you have a balance between job creation and mobility? 80% of, of the trips in Mexico got, uh, get done by public transportation, and 20% uh, uh, is done by private car. And yet it seems that all the policies are done, whether it's the elevated highways that got built uh, a few years back, uh, that are now clogged, uh, they seem to cater that 20%. In spite of small changes, such as the bike sharing program, which has been an incredible success in Mexico, we're still he having to deal with the problems of the mega city. And after working for many years in a place like NESA, first in a doctoral dissertation, then in a Biennale, Finally, someone calls you, uh, calls us and tells us, uh, well, you know something about this place, right? And, and we get asked to do a 22 kilometer long, uh, later a little bit short, and to 18 kilometer long BRT, or bus rapid transit, which as you may know, is uh, uh, the hot item in public transportation in cities. And it is, a, it is done in a place in which uh, uh, public transportation is absolutely fragmented, and yet the quality of public life in these places is very much related to the lack of planning. In other words, where you don't have planners, uh, uh, urbanity thrives. Uh, and it can be manifest in buildings such as this, uh, and with different degrees of development. So you have places like this, which uh, would get transformed by the corridor. So is it possible to imagine that this corridor, this 17 kilometer corridor, can become something more than transportation? Can it become public space? Can it engage and improve on the existing BRT systems, such as having an overpass lane, as having a double platform, as even bringing in a new cycleway that connects a number of parks that exist in NESA? In other words, to think and recognize NESA and this informal settlement as it is, and just to improve on that. And the, the miracle is that it is getting built. And, and, we've, we, and it's getting built with the cycleway, and it's getting built in relationship to the public spaces that we, that, that we imagine. These are photos uh, by Rafael Gamo, who happens to be here in the crowd. We're happy to have you here, Rafa. Uh, it's a, they show, in a way, the, uh, the way that this is uh, structured. Uh, there's, a, there's a people using now the, the lane of the bus as their cycleway. Uh, but to, to actually see that infrastructure, the way that architecture can improve the settlement has to do with infrastructure. It's quite relevant to us. Uh, very quickly, uh, I know we have three minutes. Um, uh, another project which is a breakthrough project for us is a project for uh, Ciudad Juarez. Uh, this project, uh, it's a, a small master plan, a 25 hectare master plan for the most violent and dangerous city in the world. Uh, literally, Ciudad Juarez, uh, in 2011 had more murders per 100,000 people than any other place uh, in, in, the, in the globe. And it's, it's a kind of social Detroit. It has collapsed and it has shown what the failures of planning and what the failures of the production of public space, such as this empty, empty park, but also the production of housing, how it shows uh, where architecture is, uh, is failing. Over 30%, depending on who you ask, but between 25 and 30% of the homes built in uh, Ciudad Juarez have been abandoned. What does architecture have to do with that? In, two years ago, we were commissioned to be the curators 
of the Venice Biennale in 2010. We got invited by the Colegio de Arquitectos and we decided to do a project called What Else Can Architecture, uh, 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 what, can, uh, what Else Can Architecture Do? Which was a play of words on the previous project of the 2008 Art Biennale. And uh, at some point the project got censored because someone in the federal government didn't want us talking about Juarez. Uh, a Biennale should be about celebration, a Biennale should be showing the, the landmark architecture of a, of, a, of a country, we were told, and we were asked to change, either change the project or drop the Biennale altogether, uh, so we decided to drop the Biennale. Uh, let's, let's call it light censorship, uh, but the Mexican pavilion stood empty for, uh, for the 2010 Biennale. But then uh, the irony is that four months later, uh, people from the Ministry of Social Development, they tell us, so you know a thing or two about Juarez, now we want you to do a real project in Juarez. So uh, uh, as I was telling, uh, saying earlier, uh, to, to misquote a French philosopher, you have a rock, you, sometimes you, you can break a window, but sometimes you can build a wall. And our practice is, is based on this notion of uh, breaking windows, and breaking windows can be the exhibitions, can be the biennales, can be the research, can be the teaching. And the building walls have to do with projects that address the, the, the constituent problems of a city such as Juarez. On the one hand, you have uh, security, that idea that safety, police power, is what changes reality. Here's the president announcing the program Todos Somos Juarez. But on the other, you have the idea that physical planning changes the city. That to, to change this environment, it is not about, to make this environment uh, uh, better in terms of quality of life, it's not about more policemen, it's not about bringing the army into the streets, but it's actually about engaging uh, society in a different fashion, to change the protocols of architecture, to actually, we held a number of community workshops with over 200 people attending, that themselves, and a number of uh, walking tours, to try to get the sense of what is it that, uh, that drives uh, on the one hand, the, percep the percep perception of problems, but also the possible solution. And, and we work with these people for many weeks to see if uh, our understanding of how public space, housing, and infrastructure could work together, and how that, uh, that drawing by the community could get transformed into a plan that addresses infrastructural uh, uh, problems, such as a, 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 water, um, a, a water basin, addresses problems of uh, social infrastructure, such as a uh, building of workshops, but also this rapport between informal housing and uh, state-driven housing. Uh, this is uh, one of the basins was used for sports, the other one for a skate park. Uh, the project still on hold. Uh, it received the whole same uh, bronze award in Latin America a few months ago, but, but in a way, uh, it sort of, places this idea that for us, architecture is politics. And to think that architecture can transform society in a more intelligent or strategic fashion is really crucial for us. And to, to talk briefly about two projects that we're, we're building. One of them is the Churubusco Film Labs and Producers Building, which is a, is a building for, uh, um, it's a 10,000 square meter building in, the, in the, the equivalent of the Universal Studios in Mexico City, in which we're bringing together the office of producers with the film labs so that they could be operating in the same space simultaneously. Uh, this is a project commissioned by the Ministry of Culture. Again, it has to do with this sectional overlap of, of programs and how these sectional overlaps can allow for some other uh, forms of public life to appear. The dark uh, uh, cast, uh, uh, I'm sorry, precast uh, stone, black stone is the labs, which is like a bunker, and then the iceberg-like uh, uh, volume on top is the, is the offices. And in between you have this, uh, this sense of a, a new public life uh, arising. Um, the other project, uh, which is uh, again the result of a competition, uh, with finalists, with three of the finalists with, uh, were again emerging voices uh, of a few years back, uh, but it's a, it's a project getting built in Guadalajara right now, which is a performing arts center, and it has to do with a complexity of programs because it's, uh, it's almost uh, 35,000 square meters dealing with uh, consultants here in, uh, well, in Connecticut, uh, consultants in, in Guadalajara, in Mexico, and a project that although it was won three, three years ago, almost four years, 
uh, it's just breaking ground. Uh, and it's a project where the slow and the fast are, are combined. Uh, the new Snoeta Environmental Science Museum will get built here. This is the Auditorio Telmex by Jose Moyao, the National Library by Toca Greenberg and uh, Lopez Guerra, and this is the project we, we, we won. And, uh, and this, uh, again, just, uh, just a few images of how, uh, uh, how the project is, uh, is sort of a structure as a series of boxes, again, very dumb boxes in terms of uh, uh, putting together the program. Uh, and, and getting the most out of a budget, uh, literally to think of the budget uh, ex uh, explained and developed only on a very thin strip of either glass or uh, concrete. And this is, uh, this is the construction as it stands right now. Uh, in a way, these, these are hero and anti-hero, and, and we don't mean this just because the booze and the sex at the office, but, uh, but it has to do with the fact that uh, for Don Draper, in one of his most uh, famous lines, uh, he says, actually, to the guys demolishing Penn Station to build Madison Square Garden, he says, if you don't like, the convers if you don't like what is being talked about, change the conversations. We think that architects are in the possibility of changing, expanding, and transforming the conversations that go on socially, politically, and within the realm of our profession. Uh, if we can only aspire to that sense of coolness, and uh, as Don Draper has, I think we, uh, the profession will be better off. Thank you very much. Thank you.